over the years to the National Guard. Now, we call this, now, for us, for soldiers, okay, who are uh, in federal service, we call that Title 10. Title 10 service. And when we work for the state, it's called Title 32 status. And what that is a reference to, that's a reference to the U.S. Code, the United States uh, Code, uh, which goes into the details. Uh, that's a federal law based on the Constitution. It's a federal law passed by the by the by the federal by our legislature, and it goes into details as to what that means. How does it? Pay, how do you pay for it? Uh, it adopts the UCMJ, Uniform Code of Military Justice. Uh, that's our legal code. It adopts uh, pay scales, promotion procedures, all, all the rules that apply to Title X service, uh, federal service, are contained in, in, in Title X and the regulations that, that go into more detail. The regulations are generally passed uh, by the administrative agency. Actually, the Army and the Navy are administrative agencies. So we have regulations as well. So we'll, we'll draw this down. Here's our regulations. which are administrative supplements, I guess would be the best way to put that, to law. Okay, so we have the Constitution establishes the Army Navy. We have the United States Code establishes Title X, which are federal laws. And then those laws also give rise to regulations. And the clause in the Constitution is about two sentences long. The U.S. Code is probably a book about that big on Title X, our Title X. Army regulations could fill this room, okay? They're enormous, incredibly large, okay? At the state side, uh, again, uh, the, the, the creation of the... The creation of the militia actually preceded our Constitution. The Constitution recognized the fact that states always had militias. That's sort of our historical background. Uh, prior to the establishment of the Constitution, 1789, U.S. Constitution, 1789. Prior to that, the states existed. I think in 1789 there were somewhere between 13 and 15. I can't remember if we, but I guess we only had 13 still in 1789. We, had, we started with 13 states, okay? And all of them, all of the 13 states had a militia at the time. They, they all had their own uh, military. When we fought uh, our war for independence, uh, the states kicked in their militia. That was their contribution to this. Um, the, uh, as the states grew, as the United States grew and we added more states, uh, they all adopted their, their militia. They, they recognized their militia. Now, the federal law that discusses the relationship between the state militias and uh, the federal government, that's Title 32. This is U.S. Code. But, in addition to that, is... Uh, I wish I could quote this. Indiana Code, uh, something, I can't remember what it is. But this is our military law here, our military laws. Okay? Those apply as well. Now, these laws must be consistent with the federal law. If there was an inconsistency, the federal law would trump because of, the, again, because of that supremacy clause. Okay? Then, in addition to that, we also have Indiana, Indiana regulations, military. Okay. How much do they mirror each other, just out of curiosity? Uh, a lot. For example, the UCMJ, the Uniform <laughs> Code of Military Justice, which is our criminal justice system in the military, Indiana has adopted it in whole, except 
we've got written down about 15 or 20 pages that says, wherever it's in conflict with state, the state law will trump while you're on state service. So if you're in state service, the state rules apply, but they adopt, they, 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 there's, there's a few things in there, for example, uh, officers can only be court-martialed by the governor of the state of Indiana, things like that. And then where, where, it's, where things need uh, to be, uh, where you have to sort of fill in the holes, it says we adopt the UCMJ in all other areas. So it mirrors it uh, real close. But I get confused a lot. For example, like, like Article 3, like small administrative punishment. Um, in Indiana, you can throw a kid in jail for eight days. In the federal side, for seven days. So I, I always forget which one. <laughs> yeah, that's so, yeah, yeah, by minor offenses there. Um, okay, so uh, everything is fine here. Now, uh, now the switchover. Um, uh, how does someone, how do we cross, how does someone cross from the state militia, from the National Guard, into the federal forces, into Title X forces. This happens very easily. Um, it could happen in a number of ways. Uh, it can happen uh, based on a federal emergency, a declaration from, from either a declaration of war from uh, uh, from our uh, Congress, or uh, through the War Powers Act. If the if the if the president declares an emergency, the president can activate. National Guard troops. And the way they do it is they, they put out an order of activation and they task the governor. Okay, we need a thousand troops, whatever it happens to be. And, and generally, this has not been a problem, uh, getting troops. Uh, there's, there's, all, there's, there's never been, I can't remember, I say never. Um, there's generally not a problem uh, beating that order. So, uh, and, and our, our guard is, is a reserve, is, is a reserve force, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, but can be called up. So this would be, this would be a presidential call up. Okay, so an ordering up of the reserves. I think, actually, uh, today, uh, as an analogy, uh, Israel called up their reserves. Okay, uh, they have a reserve system similar to this. They have reserve soldiers in the Israeli army because of the problems uh, in the Gaza Strip. I guess the the, uh, uh, the president of Israel called up his reserves. The pre our president does the same thing, calls them up, and then we take off the patch and we put on a federal patch. Okay, so I go from here to here with just a piece of paper. I should have brought a copy of my orders in, um, and my orders. The orders that actually come to me, okay, uh, are like one page long. And just one page just says, you are ordered to active duty, report on this day to this place. And uh, we'll take care of you from there. Don't, don't have to bring your cat, your wife, your car, <laughs> your dog, nothing. Just show up and uh, have your uniform on. And that's it. We'll take care of everything from there. And uh, that's, a, that's a presidential call, okay. Um, then, the orders are generally for a particular period of time. When that period of time ends, unless they're renewed, you revert back to Title 32 status. Okay, so the orders end, you revert back to Title 32 status. Now, uh, I started out, uh, I, now, you don't have to start as a soldier in the National Guard. You can, you can volunteer to be a federal soldier from the start without having any affiliation with the National Guard. When I started, I was just a kid out of high school, and I joined the Army, and I, I joined the Federal Army. There was no Title 32 status. There's no obligation on the part of any soldier to serve his state's National Guard. The other thing, here's the other crazy thing. This kind of shows the blending. I can be a citizen of Indiana, and I can join the Illinois National Guard, or the Kentucky National Guard if it's more convenient. You don't even have to be a state member to join. You just have to ask, hey, can I, can I join the Guard? And if there's an opening, you can get in. So the requirement to be in the Guard, there, there's none. You don't even have to be a, a, a state resident. So for example, for you guys, you know, you're the Chin National Front, right? Your Chin <laughs> Army. Now, would, are there anyone in the Chin Army other than Chin? 
No, no. No, see, if, if it was in the United States, you could be, is it, uh, uh, what was the other one? Uh, uh, Cochin or... Uh, Cochin. You could be Cochin and just say, hey, I want to join the Chin. And you join the Chin Army. Okay, which you guys obviously don't have. We have that here. You can join the Guard from Indiana. You can join the Federal Service. Or you can join the Illinois National Guard if you wanted to. It doesn't happen very often. Um, and you, uh, it's somewhat, there's, uh, you probably, like you were saying, if you're not Buddhist, you probably wouldn't get promoted to, to, to pass captain or major. Kind of similar, I guess they're sort of similar to that in the sense that if you're not an Indiana resident, you probably would not ascend to the rank of general, would be my guess. You would be looked on, because it's so connected, the higher rank, like Colonel and above, is so related to the, to the governor that unless you were from the state, you probably wouldn't. Again, don't put that in news. Please don't put that. <laughs> but that's probably true, just because of the relationship to the governor. The, the, um, now, our, uh, our commander-in-chief of the uh, Army and Navy is the U.S. president, okay? The U.S. president equals commander-in-chief. And at the National Guard, the commander is the governor. Um, we have a question. Okay. If the president would like to call up uh, National Guard, they call, uh, the president call up directly to the National Guard or through the governor? Through the governor, exactly. Okay. It's, 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 an order, it's an order to the governor. Actually, the reality is it's a request. Okay, so what happens? is we have uh, assistant uh, secretary, actually we have a secretary of defense. The, the secretary of defense is a, an assistant uh, to the president. The, you know, the president's a busy guy, okay? So he relies on the secretary of defense. Um, there are what are called undersecretary of defenses and assistant secretary of defenses. There is an undersecretary of defense of personnel. That person has a relationship to the reserves. That's actually who does it. And what they do is they call up. If we, requ if we ordered a thousand men, could you supply it? The governor, yeah, we got it. And the governor relies on, the governor contacts the TAG, the adjutant general. Two stars, General Lombarder, don't quote him. <laughs> but, that's who the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, Personnel and Readiness, calls the tag of the state of Indiana and says, if there's a call-up, can you supply us with a thousand troops? The tag would then call the governor, hey governor, got a call from the Secretary of Defense. They're gonna need a thousand troops. Are you good with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Word goes back, yes. So it's sort of like unofficially, it gets worked out in advance, and then officially, the, the president orders the call up, Indiana, you shall supply a thousand troops. They already got the word, all set, good to go, that kind of thing. This sequestration thing right now, unofficially, don't write this down at all. Unofficially, the, 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 the army is already preparing. If we have to give up another $200 billion, where will it come from? Who will get cut? And what bases will be closed? All in, all in preparation. So if the president says, it's going to happen, are you guys ready? Yeah, sir, here's our plan. Got it. In, in place. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of unofficial uh, cooperation prior to an official order that goes out uh, between the states and the federal government. And as far as I know, uh, there's generally not much conflict there. Now, could there be? I suppose so. You know, depending on you know, what happens in the world. Could there ever be a conflict? I suppose. Uh, we've been lucky, you know, we're fortunate. So uh, things are good in the United States, uh, as you know, you know. Uh, and as it's, uh, I don't know if this will be lost on you, but this, the phrase, it's easy to be a saint in paradise, okay? It's easy for this to work when times are good, okay? The challenge to this system is if we're in a situation where you guys have been at war with each other for 50 years, you know, how's it going to work in your state? You guys have serious problems. 
you're, it would be as if California was Buddhist and Indiana was Christian and Kentucky was Muslim and they, didn't, and they spoke different languages. I mean, we don't have that problem. We, we just don't have that problem. We are, as much as we're different, we're a lot more homogenous than, than I think, than other parts of the world. Um, if, if, uh, who is the ruling party in, uh, and I won't, uh, I know, I know this is somewhat of an offensive word, but uh, Myanmar, yeah. which is what they would call, you would call it Burma, uh, they want to call it Myanmar. Uh, Who, yeah. who's, who's the ruling party? The UN, UN the, the UN, the UN. If they were in this room. The Solidarity and Development Party. If, if, the UNDP and USDP. Uh, USDP, sorry. USDP. The UN, uh, if they sat here across from you, would you feel like there was cooperation and everybody got along just fine? Uh, no. Right, right. You know, right. Uh, that therein lies the uh, difference. Uh, 